Yes equals no. This sounds absurd, but it's actually very common in East Asia and core to its culture. First, East Asians have a pretty extreme aversion to saying no. Just look at articles like Reddit listing 16 ways to say no in Japanese without actually. Yeah, this is common. I mean, if you watch any animes, then it's always like pets in you or just going to ramble or whatever. Or maybe some make some big promises or something like that. It's it's not good. Ever saying the word. There are also some long standing cultural factors in East Asia that make saying yes an accepted way to mean no. In fact, the rabbit hole goes much deeper than just yes meaning no. So stick until the end if you want to see how far this contradiction goes. But I know claiming yes equals no sounds crazy, so let's start with some examples, some of which you might actually be familiar with. Some popular methods as proposed by Yamai are saying no by saying yes. For example, hey, are you coming clubbing tomorrow? Yeah, I do need to take care of my frog though if he's traveling the world right now and I just need to be at home for when he comes back. Oh. But this is just super rude. I mean, it's either yes, fuck yes, or, or no. Right? And if you go in this ramble, they would be like, oh, I know, I know you're bullshitting me. Or like, this is just uh, disrespectful and rude. And. And that's it. Oh, okay. See, you didn't say no. In fact, you said yes, but really you mean no. Okay, if that's too much, Yamaya says you can also imply no by being really vague or by changing the subject of the question. Hey, clubbing tomorrow? Dude, do you ever think about why people go to the clubs? Though? Like, before dating apps, it feels like people went to the clubs to find a date, but now it just feels like people go there to disassociate. Okay. Oh, look, you don't even have to entertain them with a response. You can just debate. Hey, clubbing? Ah, got it. I knew I had something to send. All right, at this point, I know someone... But this is rude. You just want to say no and get away with it. You, you think that like, this is better. Someone is thinking, just tell them if you don't want to go. Well, it really could be that easy. Con but that's the whole point context. of this video. Why saying no is so hard in East Asia? What kind of strategies have evolved given this culture? And how you might be able to tell next time if someone really means the yes they gave you, or if they're just saying it. To start, we have to break down this phenomenon. Of I mean, if you try this in the West, there is, well, depending on the culture, there is a very high chance that you get grilled down into some specific commitment. I was like, oh yeah, I can make it tomorrow. Okay, fine. It's gonna be day after tomorrow. It's gonna be five sharp. It's like, let's go. It's like, oh yeah, I can make it at five. That's fine. We can do it at seven. It's like, okay, well, I can make it there. Okay, well, we're gonna be somewhere else. It's like, uh, yeah, I can I can make it tomorrow uh, that day either. It's like, that's fine. We can do it like a week, week later. It's like, and that's pretty much what you're gonna get. They're just gonna grill you. Until they act, you're gonna like admit, like, okay, I just don't wanna go. Something like that. This is what is gonna happen to you and you're gonna feel a little silly. No, no. They, they they really uh, pick up what you're putting down that you don't care and you're just being rude about it. Avoiding no, and it really comes down to two things. Let's talk about the art of politeness and the importance of face. Why is saying no so hard? Aside from some of us being innate people pleasers, saying no is hard because this response usually contradicts with the expectations of the asker. No one is ever going to ask for something expecting to be turned down, so they come to you, That's and then you have to let them down. Even if you have a valid reason, saying no can still suck. How much it sucks though is dependent on a lot of factors, like how close you are with them, what sort of relationship you have, what kind of person they are, the size of the position, whether you're turning down a big ask or a small thing, and some other factors that probably have more weight in East Asia, like their rank. Are they a senior? Are they older than you? And if you are in a position to say no, taking into consideration social hierarchies, expectations, and possible consequences depending on the context. We'll talk Basically, you want to say no and get away with it. Or at least as much as possible. possible. We'll walk us through what happens when we turn someone down. Because saying no is an act of refusal, it's also known as a face threatening act. You don't want to make someone lose face or make them feel embarrassed or hurt when you reject an invitation to hang or reply that you can't help them out with what they're asking. Because of this, we have to be more considerate in how we deliver our refusals. This consideration really is just being polite. In fact, Brown and Levinson define politeness as a complex system for softening face threatening acts. Politeness can range from a simple and direct no thank you to all these examples we had at the beginning where no wasn't even mentioned in the response. In these latter cases, it seems like a big, big justification, <laughs> big smokescreen for just not saying uh, no. It's a very deliberate way to preserve face for the other person, and it's also very indirect. These elaborate soft rejections are intricately designed to reflect the other person's age, rank, and seniority, all of which would impact the level of politeness deemed appropriate in East. But is this really face threatening? I mean, uh, face preserving? Imagine like like some guy came up to you, and like, and you said like instead of saying no, he's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm not into guys right now. You know, I mean, I'm not really uh, open tomorrow. Like, oh yeah, this is such a good excuse. Nah, right? So it's bullshit, right? Age. I don't like this hierarchy bullshit. East Asian interactions. This link is highlighted by Cyril as he says, politeness is the chief motivation for indirectness. East Asian societies are also quite hierarchical and they place a strong emphasis on maintaining group harmony. Given this context, if you decide... Yeah, but what is a fucking hierarchy though? Right? I mean, the thing is, people need to agree to that hierarchy because you might... Because it's just make-believe nonsense, right? You might think like your high high status or it might think they are low status or it might think whatever they fall in, right? Then you have people who just don't give a fuck, right? They just do whatever like, they, they like and they might come off as extremely dominant. Because, like, no one cares about this uh, make-believe. No, I could understand some meritocratic. I guess you can call it hierarchy, but most of it is just, you know, they have some stupid suit, stupid stupid hat, whatever. They just, like, have a good starting position, just because, like, maybe they're older. But this means nothing, right? This decision already kind of upsets the group harmony, so it's really on you now to express the sentiment in a non-threatening, even flattering way, depending on how senior the other person might be. Really, you just want to make sure the other person doesn't lose face. In politeness theory, face can be positive and negative, and this is relevant in any social situation. Positive face is our desire to be appreciated, validated, and liked. It's tied to our self-esteem. If you wanted to appeal to this whilst asking for a favor, you could say, "Could you help me with a sign, please? You're the smartest in our class, and you know the most on this topic." Flattery does wonders in appealing to positive. But this, this is not good. You just, you're just trying to manipulate them into saying yes, right? I, I heard this bullshit like thousands, at least thousands, endless times before. They just try to grease you up into saying yes and it's just annoying like you know why not just say that fuck you i i well no, maybe not not say that but like you know i ask your favor and that's it you know not like 
try to grease you up. It's like, oh, you're so smart, you're so pretty, something like that. Positive face, then you have negative face, which... Because you just know. The thing is, I mean, you, you might not get this. You're not felt it enough times, but you just know that this, this greasing up just leads to a favor. Like, yeah. hey, hey, you're so smart, can you give me your wallet, something like that? That's exactly how it feels like. Which concerns our freedom to do what we want. In order to be considered this, when you ask someone for a favor, you could slip in words to make the request seem less of a burden. Like, hey, can I ask you a little question? Or should I be mindful of that time by saying, I'm sorry to bother, but blah, blah, blah. In rejecting someone, we keep in mind the same three basic ones. You can appeal to positive face by turning down an event saying, that sounds like it would be a great time. However, I can't make it. You can also speak to negative face referring to yourself. I would lend you money, but I'm in a bind too, so I can't help you. The next reason for why because I don't the thing is you don't care like you don't you don't have one fucking dollar to give them no you just don't care right that's it so you just want yeses and get away with no's that's it and for why yes means no has to do with power we mentioned East Asia having a more hierarchical structure in society so these are cultures which we would say have a high power distance power distance refers to how accepted it is that there will be an unequal distribution of power in East Asia people accept this difference in power as a result of seniority or age and they will be quite conscious of behaving according to where they are in the hierarchy in Japanese the social norms you would follow in order to be properly polite is good yeah but we don't get it what, what about like autistic people or those who are like, yeah, yeah, like that guy with the stupid hat? Uh, yeah. But Wakimae, following Wakimae influences how you would speak to someone, which would then naturally include how you refuse someone. And we can imagine saying no to someone who's higher up in the hierarchy would be harder than saying no to your sibling or friends. Yeah, but who says what what is a hierarchy though, right? Like, let's say that some guy, you know, wearing some techie clothes with a stupid hat and they just like, they, was, they were like bored to some some idiot who happened to be rich, called, called dibs on some land. Are they high... High status, high, very respectful, higher in the hierarchy, or they're just a fucking idiot. He did a study on this as he asked Japanese respondents who they struggled with saying no to the most, and the most common answer was their boss. In fact, the two respondents who didn't answer with their boss hadn't yet entered the workforce, and they instead said refusing their upperclassmen was the hardest. One respondent elaborates on the situation in a Japanese company. I mean, you don't really have a shit much of a freedom to say no to your boss. I, I guess the the logic behind this that within the context of the society, you are very much constrained to act in a certain way, and if you don't act like that. Then there are gonna be consequences. That's why everyone's trying to get away with uh, saying no and try to grease each other into saying yes. For example, we have to obey your boss. We have this kind of culture. If I refuse an invitation, I will feel anxiety. I'm afraid they might not invite me again. And this anxiety of the consequences when saying no. No, that would be a good thing if they are professional about it. Like, okay, just don't want to come. Just don't don't come, right? That would be a good thing. But they're probably not gonna be professional. But because you need to like uh, show up to some after work events or something like that to get get promoted, or at least not get fired. No, no, could explain why most Japanese respondents refuse their boss with a response like this. I'm terribly sorry, but I've made another plan for that day a long time ago. So I'm very sorry, but I'll have to say no to your wonderful invite. Yeah, but like you would like stop listening like uh, like oh uh, over here like at the very start basically. This is just bullshit. You don't you don't want to listen to this. And it is always annoying when someone like try to ask you for something and they like spend like literal minutes just trying to grease you up to it. Like no no I don't care. Just just ask. Yeah, also like. If you're getting a no, you just want to hear no. That's it. Nothing else. Right. Compare this to how American respondents would refuse their boss, appealing again to that positive face and beginning with, that would be wonderful, before expressing the regret of not being able to. Uh, but the thing is, if you're dealing with someone extremely direct, they're like, they're just going to follow it up, follow it up, follow it, follow it, follow it up, until you can got to reject them. Just straight up. They're like, oh, that would be wonder. I can't attend this time. Oh, okay, that's going to be tomorrow. Then like, oh, I can't attend tomorrow. I got to be the next day. Right? The thing is, like, yeah, that could be a interesting culture clash. Let's go with that. Being able to make it, the work culture in Japan with its strong hierarchies, power distance, and emphasis on group harmony could have led to Japanese. So, I mean, it would only work if you if you get it that they're just kind of letting you down, but like in a in a kind of rude way. It's like uh. Japanese respondents being more apologetic in tone. But the thing is, like, they might some some guy might mean 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 this, other other might not. So. Especially in the, in a Western context, because in in Asia you might think that everyone think like that, but in a in a, in a Western context, they might not, right? Am I just not make it tomorrow? It's like okay, I'm just gonna okay. Well, I they have to yeah, I can make it. Like okay, that that's it. GG. Whilst weaker workplace hierarchies and a more equal distribution of power in the West, we have allowed American speakers to open more positively and even talk more informally in turning down the same invite. Soft rejection therefore becomes a life skill in East Asia. So because of these Asian countries valuing face, prioritizing group harmony, and in having a considerable power distance, you get an environment where yes becomes no, and a whole bunch of other refusal strategies to do. Here are the sixteen ways we have to put forward to say no. I won't go through all of them, but feel free to pause and take a look. Although I do. Huh? Silence. Vague no. Yeah, that's annoying. Vague and ambiguous yes. Yeah, that's annoying. Silence. How would that work? Just stare them down? That's pretty dominant. I like it. On to question. Uh, I mean, uh, honestly, that's that's good if you are looking to secure the thing. What do you ask? It, but that wouldn't be it, I guess. Tangential responses. 
Uh, exiting, leaving the room, flying, liquidification. Criticizing the question, refusing the question, conditional no. Yeah, that's just not good. Saying no, I won't go through all of them, but feel free to pause and take them. The thing is, like, if they value that time, they're gonna respect you for saying uh, a straight no. And take a look. Although I really think some of these would do more harm than good. Like, if I ever asked someone to hang out and they called another seven and left the room, I would quite literally never recover. You can just bury. I mean, that's rude, but like, at least clear. I mean, in the room, you left me in. East Asia has many cultural expectations of how one should act or respond that is fitting of their role within society and a relationship with others. I go into the cultural context in more depth on my last video, but the major influence is Confucian philosophy. Why Asian, Asian parents never love you? <laughs> which emphasize virtues such as respect and outline clear social hierarchies that are still relevant today. With these cultural expectations, then, of how one should act in East Asia, fitting. I think, yes, anyone who outlines social hierarchies tends to place themselves at the top of the social hierarchy. That's what people like. People don't like social hierarchies, they like having good seats, right? Fitting of their role, what happens when we have intentions that go against that? Saying yes when we want to say no is a pretty specific example of this conflict. More generally, it's common for these patients to say one thing and for it to not reflect what they're actually thinking at all. But that's oh. Like I said, it's common for these patients to say one thing and really mean another, and refusals are only the tip of the iceberg here. In Japanese, there are two words that perfectly delegate the divide between what we think and what we say, and it captures how this might actually be in conflict. That is honne and tatemai. Honne describes our true feelings, whereas tatemai is what we show in public. You might not want to go to an event. Just like real voice and, and front. Event. That's honne, but if you say you'll try your best to attend, that's tatemai. Or maybe you bump into someone that you haven't seen in a while, and after some small talk, you both say, we should totally hang out. If this were two agents talking, there's... Red. <laughs> the 95% chance that they're not going to follow through on that. Being able to discern intent from what's actually being said is therefore really important in understanding East Asian culture. Because these Asians prioritize space, the words that are being spoken out loud cater for the feelings of the other person rather than what one might actually think. Because of the discrepancy in what is said and what is meant, East Asian cultures are known as high context cultures. This term was first introduced by Hall in 1976 in exploring how different cultures communicate. Uh -huh. Hall describes high context cultures as one in which most of the info is either in the physical context or internalized in the person, where very little is in the coded, explicit, transmitted part of the message. Which means the real meaning of what people say is often not in the words. It's something you pick up on through shared values from knowing the person or from physical cues around you. As high context cultures rely on social cues more, a good communicator is one who is able to read the room. Words like munti and kuki wayomu highlight exactly this trait of being able to read between the lines when it comes to forming and maintaining relationships. And since we have high context cultures, we also have low context cultures. And Hall defines low context cultures as where the mass of the information is vested in the explicit code. So most of the information that the other person now, you should, ideally, should be fully expressing yourself, right? The person wants to say will be made explicit and told to you. A good communicator in a low-context culture is someone who expresses what they feel and think, because you shouldn't expect someone else to read your mind. If you're curious about what kind of culture your country has, this is Hall's classification, which is very dependent upon by scholars since Hall hasn't provided... Japan to Germany? Mm -hmm. ...provided any quantitative processes for how he determined the ranking, so just a heads up... That's actually interesting, that England is not as direct. Up, many scholars have called this out for being anecdotal. But if you see your country, let me know. Do you agree with which side it's on? Cause the mention of high and low context. Also, it's not set in stone. I guess it, it depends. And also, it's really up to the particular person how they communicate. Especially in countries where, like, you just have, like, a mix of cultures. That could be misunderstanding. And I would argue that even more important to be direct. Context cultures remains very influential despite the criticism with the ranking of countries. One thing to point out though is that collectivism and individualism often coincides with a high and low context distinction, which is interesting and also makes a lot of sense because collectivist cultures place more emphasis on the relationships you hold with other people. So to prioritize those relationships, you might say things you don't always mean. Conversely, individualist cultures place more emphasis on oneself, so it could foster a preference for more direct communication instead of always beating around the bush. I think we're starting to see now that good communication will vary depending on cultural backgrounds. Good and Park did a fascinating study looking into the kind of communication different cultures prefer. An example of a scenario the gate respondents were: your partner has developed a habit that you do not like, and you want to address the issue with him or her. How would you go about communicating? Participant no fat. So then given a range of actions from telling them as clearly as possible to finding an opportunity to gently bring it up with them, expecting that they would get their point. Go and Park found that Chinese respondents preferred indirect communication regardless of the situation balance, and European America... Yeah, but they're not gonna get it, right? Indirect. Americans prefer direct methods of communication more compared to Chinese respondents. Most importantly, when respondents were asked about imagining the partner's communication style in which they would anticipate greater relationship satisfaction, Chinese respondents imagined a more indirect communication style, whilst European American respondents imagined a more direct communication style. I do want to add a little bit more nuance to our discussion at the moment, though, because I don't want the takeaway to be East Asia equals indirect communication equals never expressing how you feel. To provide more depth here, let's take a look at the concept of amaya in Japan. Like many cultural concepts, it's hard to translate, but it's commonly viewed as dependency and indulgence. And amaya will allow us to understand why we can't just assume East Asians always communicate indirectly. This bullseye graph holds the answer. This model is Tezuka's 1986 conceptualization of amaya, and she proposes two sides to amaya, which then leads to different forms of communication. At the core of any interaction is, according to Tezuka, Got this bullseye here, which is our need for oneness and belonging. Then this next ring on the uh, is our dependency. Born from our need of wanting to know if others will be there for us. Amaya therefore facilitates communicating within your ancestry, which is communicating indirectly. On the right, again standing from this need of oneness, we have the acceptance need, which is our desire to be accepted by others despite all our failures, mistakes, and weaknesses. And it's here that Amaya actually serves to facilitate a more direct communication style. Nika elaborates on Tesca's model. As he explains, Amaya shows up as dependence resulting in an indirect style of speech when we talk to strangers, acquaintances, and those of higher status because we don't know if they will meet our need of being there for us. So we ask in an indirect way, and if they were to reject us, it would also be done indirectly. Otherwise, if we're too direct with what we're asking, we can make the other person uncomfortable. And if they're too direct with their response, especially if it's a refusal, that could hurt us. Amaya, however, manifests as indulgence with family, close friends. Hmm? But that could be just miscommunication. And also, like, are, 
I guess you're just afraid to be yourself because you don't want to be rejected for who you are. I love it like that. I try to be like, I'm not sure it's just, it also be done indirectly. nice. Otherwise, if two direct people were asking, we can make the other person uncomfortable. And if they're too direct with their response, especially if it's a refusal, that could hurt us. I might help them manifest as indulgence with family, close friends, and people we do know well, and this results in more direct communication because we trust that we can stay our feelings and intentions and that they will stick by us even if there's conflict or if we behave poorly. We have Japanese students as quoted by Miki. But this, this would kind of like prove that, I mean, people want to be direct and that way accepted and loved for who they are. And you need direct communication to, to actually get things done, I guess. Mika saying, Amaya doesn't work abroad. You have to say everything. Compare this to Maynard's observation of conflict in Japanese culture. Confrontations often occur. It not just, not just doesn't necessarily work, but it is rude. It doesn't occur among close friends, where the Amaya relationship is well established. Amaya is referred in such different ways because they were actually... Amaya is referred in such different ways because they were actually talking about two manifestations of it. One that prohibited direct speech and one that facilitated it. I know I could have said East Asians were talking directly with people they don't know and directly with people they do know, but it's not the same. One last point I want to highlight as well is this need for dependency. I want to call this out because it's actually viewed quite differently in the East versus the West. In the West, dependency is often seen as a threat to autonomy, whereas in the East, it's that means with anyone who you're not close with, they, they don't really know you and you're just being fake with them and probably it's exhausting to interact with them because of this, because you're just putting on some dumbass mask. It's encouraged and it's and you're probably wasting their time and they don't like that. Actually viewed as a necessary part of relationships. You can see this difference in how kids would often move out in the West by 18, but it's common for Asian kids to continue living with their family throughout their 20s. Dependency isn't seen as an obligation as it might be perceived in the West. Rather, in the East, it's more of a warm feeling of commitment. Another example will be how in the uh, yeah. West. Okay, you're 18 now. Time to be a, a wage slave and pay thousands of rents. I hope you die. Something like that. Now, I don't think this is that wrong in in the right society. Kind of like pushing them to, to for more, but possibly. But, yeah. It, it needs the right circumstances. If they can just move out, you know, buy a house, you know, and I mean, that would be best. Like, imagine if they could just move out to a house and and maybe a good job, but possibly they just had a like, decent amount of money. Let's say that's like yeah, 5 million, right? You know, invested. And they're like, yeah, live a good life. And mostly people are staying home because they can't do that. No, of course, if you enjoy your uh, company of your parents, that, that's great. But my point is, people are big part staying home because they have to. And if you send people out into the wild, that doesn't mean they're gonna make it. It's it's kinda it's kinda rough in the West right now. Now I would be kinda like partial to, to, to leaving, but I mean it only really works out if the if the world is not rigged like right now. In the West, you'd often split the bill evenly, with everyone paying the juice, so there's no obligation between them. Or they have money. Compare this to Asian practices of saying, Oh, I got this, you can get it next time. This view of knowing that there is <laughs> Paying the Jews, so there's no obligation between anyone. Yeah, splitting would be normal. Compare this to Asian practices of saying, Oh, I got this, you can get it next time. This view of knowing that. Yeah, if someone said that in the West, there's a good chance, a very good chance, that they're just taking advantage of others, and there's gonna be no next time, or next time is gonna. Next time they're gonna say the same thing. <laughs> Fucking bastards. Point that there is a next time, and that you're both depending and reciprocating off each other makes the obligation feel warm. I just realized this video could give people trust issues. I mean, that's, this is kind of nice interdependence. This is nice. obviously not the intention, and I probably need to emphasize here that at the end of the day, East Asians saying yes when they mean no is usually an act out of respect for you and consideration for the group dynamic. I would say, like, Asians kind of have a better idea. Because, like, interdependence is probably better than just toxic, possibly toxic. I shouldn't call it toxic, just independence. Dynamic. And East Asians. So it's not really about like being dependent versus being independent, but like interdependent. And uh, yeah. Asians do communicate directly to you, as I mentioned, but saying what's really on their mind is more reserved for people they're very close to. When I told my mom I was first planning to make this video, she actually laughed because this soft rejection to reserve face is such a big part of East Asian culture, but it's not something everyone is aware of. I hope this video was insightful in showing how different types of communication styles might be valued. Let me know in the comments what you thought was most interesting. I personally love the distinction of high and low context cultures. It's really simple, but I also feel like it explains so much. Finally, a yeah, you definitely need to get used to it if, if you're not familiar with it. <laughs> it's gonna be like, oh yeah, it's gonna be like, oh yeah, we're gonna meet up. It's like, okay, like, why didn't they contact me? Like, what's going on? So, yeah. So, what is respectful? Really, it depends on the culture, at least.